Okay, folks, let's let's get rolling. Um, I know we've got a lot to talk about. So um, welcome to everybody. Thanks so much for being here tonight or this afternoon, I guess, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. And we're excited to host uh, former political prisoners Eric King, Jake Conroy, and Claude Marx to discuss staying active in liberation struggles after release, and also the importance of archiving our histories of resistance. Uh, so uh, this is part of a series that we've been doing um, with uh, our friends at AK Press and um, Eric and Josh, uh, the editors of Rattling the Cages. Firestorm uh, is a 16-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. And we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. We're also continuing to do book events um, virtually, uh, some of them anyway, um, because we do love to be able to connect with people at a distance. And we know that for a lot of folks in our community, uh, the accessibility of online programming is still uh, highly desirable. Uh, our schedule is a little up in the air right now um, because of flooding. Uh, but if you're interested in keeping up with our future events, follow us on social media, and I'll share a link uh, to our newsletter in the chat. Um, yeah, and just a note, we th this, this is a little unconventional here. Um, I am in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, that's where Firestorm is located. And uh, we have had uh, truly devastating flooding um, in the last two weeks uh, that's resulted in some pretty challenging conditions. So I'm here in an apartment instead of in a bookstore, I'm trying to find good internet. It's possible that my internet might drop at some point, in which case uh, Josh will step in. Um, but yeah, Asheville continues to not have any running water. And I think about a third of our community is actually still without electricity. So it's kind of a, a wild time. Um, uh, and there's a whole conversation there about climate change and uh, inequity. But uh, moving, moving into the topic at hand, uh, I want to make sure you know that there is a Q&A tool available tonight. Uh, if you've got questions for the panelists, I uh, would encourage you to use that. You can write out those questions at any point during the conversation. Um, it's always great to have a little bit of a a queue of questions when we get towards the end of the event that we can pull from. Um, so don't uh, don't wait till the last minute. And uh, we'll get started. I'll just share a little bit about each of our panelists. So uh, Claude Marx was imprisoned for his involvement in an escape conspiracy to free Puerto Rican independistas and political prisoner uh, Oscar Lopez Rivera. Uh, Claude has worked in radical media since the late 1960s and is co-founder and co-director of the Freedom Archives. In 2016, uh, Claude traveled to Palestine as part of an anti-prison delegation that focused on political imprisonment and solidarity between prisoners in the US and Palestine. He's also worked uh, on, uh, excuse me, worked to free numerous political prisoners and continues to fight uh, for prison abolition. I should also say that the event tonight um, is a little bit of a fundraiser uh, for the Freedom Archive. And if you didn't donate um, when you signed up, we sure would appreciate if you would uh, hop over to their website and throw them just a little something, whatever you can. Uh, we wanna make sure that these events, in addition to producing fantastic conversations um, for folks to enjoy live and uh, as an archive, um, also generate resources for our movement when possible. I'll put a link in the chat in just a moment. Uh, next up, we've got Eric King, uh, who's a father, poet, author, and activist. Last December, he was released from the Supermax ADX prison after spending nearly 10 years as a political prisoner uh, for an active protest over the police murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, he's uh, he was held in solitary confinement for years and was met with violence by guards throughout his incarceration. Eric's published three zines, Battle Tested, Antifa in Prison, and Pacing in My Cell. Uh, his sentencing statement was included in the book Defiance, Anarchist Statements Before a Judge and Jury. And Eric now works as a paralegal for the Bread and Roses Legal Center. And last but not least, we've got Jake Conroy, who uh, Firestorm actually had the pleasure of hosting in person over the summer for a fantastic uh, event. 
Jake is a longtime animal rights activist who was sentenced to four years in prison for his involvement in the uh, Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty Campaign, that's SHAC. Jake has been involved in various forms of activism since the mid-1990s, working on campaigns both local and international. The Shack 7, as he and his co-defendants became known, uh, were tried as domestic terrorists for running a website and supporting controversial tactics uh, and ideologies. Since his release, uh, he has remained tirelessly committed to the struggle on many fronts. He's currently the host of the Three Minute Thursday show on his Cranky Vegan YouTube channel, although I did hear that maybe it had been a minute since one of those was released. Um, uh, and he's the co-host of Radicals and Revolutionaries, an oral history podcast about direct action movements. So incredibly pleased to have all three of y'all with us tonight. Thanks for making the time. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Eric, who's going to kind of run the show here. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Claude, Jake, thank you both so much for joining me. I consider you both good friends and comrades. So this is a real joy for me to have you. Uh, at least you, Claude. Um, so, <laughs> so what I'd like to start with is that both of you were, in my view, a part of mass movements, whether it's anti-imperialist, um, anti-government, anti-animal cruelty. So this is a two-part question, but I'll start with the first part. And I'd like to know, when you were free and you saw the repression coming down from the state on others, you saw them arresting people, giving sentences. Did that have any impact on how you viewed your movement or your own participation within it? God. Oh, you want me to start? Whoever. Like, okay. Um, first of all, thank, thanks for having me. Um, as you know, it took a lot of arm twisting to get me to agree. <laughs> So uh, I think Jake, you were you probably were the linchpin of the whole thing. In any case, um, you know the. I guess at, at the core of your question is really trying to understand um, the context in which we organize and the reasons why we organize. Um, you know, if we're not happy with the way. Uh, the the state, the corporations, the ruling class is handling things, then, you know, we have a responsibility to take that on and try to change it. Um, and the nature of the state teaches us, if we study it, which I think is an important thing, it, it teaches us that in essence, because um, especially here in the U.S., you know, we're dealing with a state that has a history of being settler colonial in essence, arriving at power through brutality and violence, stealing land and genocide, uh, enslaving people. You know, if you come to power by those means, you're also going to hold on to power by those means. And so... To me, that's a fundamental thing about how we see ourselves in relationship to whatever aspect of struggle that we're engaging in. Because if we're challenging their power, we can't be shocked by repression. Repression is the essence of how they come to power and how they maintain it. And so an inherent part of disagreeing with the state and its values and fighting for something more just and equitable and a different kind of world means taking that on in whatever capacity one decides to do it. But we shouldn't be shocked if, if they aren't playing by the rules. They're, they're making the rules in order to maintain power because in the absence of the rules and in the absence of compliance to the rules, what else is there but the military, the police, all the various agencies of the state that are about reinforcing those power relations? 
And so demonstrating is one thing, but it's in that context that it takes place. Um, so because part of the theme of our getting together and chatting is has to do with sticking with it in the long run, I mean, this struggle to change the nature of certainly U.S. imperialism and the U.S. as this probably, you know, the most violent empire historically that's ever existed. I mean, look at how, how they're, you know, supplying the arms for the Zionist genocide today, for example. Um, you know, they're not playing by any moral standard a fair game here this is not a democratic process in which you get to choose the kind of values that you live under that's not what we're dealing with we're dealing with you know parties that are in control that essentially agree on maintaining empire through violence and um here we are um realizing that it's going to take more than one or two generations to really change that so it's not just about individual decisions uh about sticking with it it's about building movement that has longevity understands the nature of the state and builds a capacity ultimately in the long run to change the power relations and that doesn't mean that they're going to change their minds and give it up because of some, you know, thing that happens in an electoral thing, because they're not. No. Oh, all right. Thank you. Uh, Jake. Yeah. Uh, first off, um, I want to give a big shout out to Firestorm. Uh, as was mentioned, I was down there. It's such an incredible place. And I was really inspired by the community. And all the work that's going on there and then to see that whole area just get devastated um, was obviously very difficult to watch from afar. And I can only imagine even worse um, being there. But seeing Firestorm's response in such like a, a amazing um, example of mutual aid has been really inspiring to me and to watch from afar. Um, and um, if there's any way that myself or the rest of us can help, I hope I hope that's um that's passed on. Um, and also amazing to be here with, with Eric and Claude, um, two people I really admire. Um, so thanks so much. Um, and I've already forgotten what the question is, but I think it was nothing. <laughs> repeat it one Basically, more quick. Uh, to run it short, when you were free and you saw the government repression coming down, did that impact how you viewed your movement or your role within it? Yeah, when I first got involved in activism in in the mid '90s, um, and I pr predominantly was really involved in the animal rights movement, it wasn't really animal rights literature that I was given. It was it was history of other movements, and it was the importance of security culture, and it was this is all the stuff that the government and corporations have done to stop social change in the past, um, and is currently doing and could be doing in the future. Um, I don't think that's um, I don't feel like that's done probably as much as it was back in my day and perhaps Claude's day or, you know, um, it feels that that is just kind of these weird conspiratorial things or, you know, um, like uh, that would never happen to me. But I think the reality is, like, as Claude has said, it is it is a state that is not interested in losing um, and they are going to not just fight fairly they're going to fight dirty and they're going to fight really nasty nasty ways um and so i think as like an activist i kind of learned early on to expect that kind of uh, repression and oppression um and to prepare for it and to think about it um and um understand that that could come my way um and as time went on I saw it more and more, um, you know, I, I can remember the, f I think I got involved in activism in 1995. And I know that the first time that the government or um, private investigators or corporate interests were following me or monitoring me and or my friends was 1996. So it was like less than a year. And that went as far as, uh, as long as 2013. 
Um, what's happened since then, I don't really know. Um, but there was always from the very beginning an understanding like they are out to to stop you. Um, and I think to a certain extent that definitely um, it it um, it makes you look at organizing uh, differently. It makes you um, think about community differently um, and in positive ways and negative ways. Um, specifically when we were doing the Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty campaign, um, you know, the federal government said that we were the biggest threat to the security of the United States, which was pretty laughable. Um, but they were very um, nervous and upset and angered by what we were doing and how much we were able to affect capitalism, um, how much we were able to get the largest corporations in the world to do what we wanted them to do as a small radical grassroots organization or movement. Um, <clears throat> and we knew that that would come with a price. I think that, um, I think over the course of the five years that we did that campaign, we were sued 24 different times, 23, 24 different times. We had federal civil RICO suit brought against all of us for $12 million a piece. And we managed to be all of those. Um, and we managed to navigate our way or nav navigate our way around those. Um, and I think that put a bit of like machismo in, into the uh, us and the campaign where we felt like, Oh, we can't be stopped. Or, you know, it, it, it was, it was kind of like a pounding of the chest. Like, so when we got the bigger case with that, that the, the terrorism case, um, we just thought, ah, it's just another one that um, that we'll just get around and it'll be fine. It didn't work out that way. Um, and we're all found Are guilty. Are you guys the first animal rights group to get hit with the terrorism charges? Mm, we we're the first organization. There were people that were um, charged with those with that particular um, uh, charge, that particular crime. Um in the past, but we were the first uh, above ground um, organization that was targeted with that specific law. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that if, if we, if we want, but I'm happy to do that. But I, I do think that like it, that it, it was a good reminder or it is a good reminder that, um, that, you know, we won 23, we won 24 cases, but it was that 25th one that got us. And I think that like, idea of oh they can't touch us they can't you know we're unstoppable type of thing um is a problem and i think that sometimes that does you can see that kind of uh, mentality seep into our activist spaces where oh we're untouchable or they're not going to be able to do anything um but they are always there they're always coming after you they're always coming for you um and to stop you um and it doesn't mean that you can't get around that and beat that but it means that they 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 will not stop until they get what they want. And so I think that like I'd always thought about it in my organizing, but it wasn't until we got kind of arrogant about it that it caught up with us in a big way. So the follow up and thank you both. Um, the follow up question to that is because this is a uh, this is a prison centered talk mostly. So I'd like to know if when you did get put down, both of you, um, how how was the support from your selective communities? Like, did your animal rights community or anti-imperialist or anti, uh, anti whatever, did your communities show up for you in ways that you felt loved and safe as much as you can be and seen, or did you feel like left behind when you went inside? And Claude, you can start. Well, I mean, you know. I consider myself to be pretty fortunate in the sense that I had a large community, um, even though I had been, you know, um, absent from it as an organizer for many years because of choosing to be part of clandestine work. But nevertheless, the the politics of our case, um, the work in solidarity with Black Liberation and Puerto Rican independence, things of that nature, um, you know, there was a pretty vibrant movement all along. Um, and, you know, for myself personally, I was certainly prepared for imprisonment in the sense of 
A, making a choice to do a non-collaborative surrender after many years, um, mainly because we all wanted to get back to doing public organizing work and were isolated in clandestinity and not being very impactful. Um, so part of the choice was, yeah, we're going to take a hit. Um, and in making that decision, you know, people were there and stepped up, not just around myself, but certainly uh, my family and my greater collective, which was all being supported. So, you know, in my case, a partner and kids. And um, so I don't think, I think the main thing about prison for me was not whether or not I stayed connected, but was trying to figure out how to be, you know, how to do a level of consciousness building inside, uh, dealing with isolation, being productive, both within the prisoner community, uh, but also staying connected to struggles that were happening at the same time outside the walls. Um, I talked to James Kilgore uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he had said that being underground, he was able to sort of function because like at that time frame, he was able to get the fake IDs and everything. And it wasn't as hard to still like have a functioning life underground. And my question to him was like, did being underground feel like its own prison? Would you, I, do you, can you expand on that at all real quick? So the real question in my case is, is a question about why would someone choose to be part of a clandestine struggle about a, 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 a to be part of trying to build an infrastructure that could can function outside the purview of the state. Why does why does why is that um, a defensible, a viable political choice? And you know, not to say that we succeeded at doing that in some tremendous ways. Um, but if you think about it, and this harkens back to what I was trying to say about the say about the nature of the state, is a successful movement has to function on many levels, certainly on a mass level, without a doubt. But certain kinds of work have to function outside that purview of the state by people who aren't identifiable. And in making a choice like that, you're making a choice to be part of a political and at times a military functional structure. Um, and in deciding to be part of something like that, in, in, in the most ideal sense, people are aware of the dangers and the risks um, to life that are implicit in that. I mean, the state is functioning against mass movements with death squads. We know that. They attacked and executed members of the Black Panther Party. They attacked and executed members of the American Indian Movement. They attacked and executed members of the Chicano-Mexicano struggle. They did the same with the Puerto Ricans. Um, any type of movement that that challenges uh, the nature of the state and that tries to exert liberatory politics is going to be thumped. And speaking of thumping, um, this is Fleet Week in San Francisco, and I just heard the first strafing of San Francisco by a military jet called a Blue Angel. And uh, so if that happens again, you'll know what's happening. Um, so really the question is, isn't how comfortable is it doing clandestine work? It's, you know, is that is that really a viable choice to be made? And how does that fit into one's vision of what developing a 
a more impactful revolutionary struggle, you know, what is that about? And I'm not saying everybody should do that or this is the time to do that or anything like that. But at the time that we made that decision, um, others had already done that and others were projecting a rebuilding of a capacity to function in a clandestine way. And so with all the risks that are implied, that's part of what you decide to do if you make that choice for yourself or part of a collective process. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jake, um, animal rights and earth liberation movements are, in my mind, or at least amongst my friends, known as being some of the best supported, that the people that support your work show up in a very big, tangible way when those folks are inside. When you went down, was that your experience? Like, did you feel, did you feel seen and uh, supported while you were inside? Yeah, for sure. It was incredible. Um, I had done you know, prisoner, political prisoner support before that, um, for Good. years, you know, encouraging people to, um, you know, write letters and do fundraisers and stuff like that. Um, and, but I had never been on the receiving end of it. And I remember like day two that I was in prison and I'm like, where are all these letters? What's going on? I thought, you know, and then I remember, you remember the first letter I got on like day four and I remember who it was from. It was from a friend of mine named Lance and he wrote me a letter and I was like, oh, this is amazing. And then, um, you know, I think within, by the end of that week, I was getting 30, 40, 50 letters a day. Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Yeah. I didn't keep up like that, but it definitely, it definitely, uh, that was, what was my experience and it was incredible. I never experienced anything like that before. And, um, I think that support is instrumental in, in surviving, right. Not just figuratively, but literally. Um, and, um, you know, it wasn't just getting letters. People sent me books, people donated money, um, so that I could, have money on my books um to buy things at the commissary if i needed them um people um you know if they could which was pretty rare um were able to visit um and also a really important uh type of support that i got um which we often don't think about is after i got out and got put into a halfway house you're gonna get to that well never mind then <laughs> uh, but the amazing thing was you know, as an animal rights activist, it was, you know, um, I hoped, you know, and and saw a lot of support from fellow animal rights activists all over the world and environmental activists. But there also was, you know, like the Jericho movement listing us um, with their political prisoners and like beyond just being incredibly grateful that for that, I was very like honored um, to see people that I had, you know, respected and looked up to and read about since my early days of being an activist now being listed alongside them felt very like, I don't know, it felt special and it felt like I was seen in a much bigger way. Um, and felt like there was a little bit of like a, a feeling of solidarity that I hadn't really felt before. And that felt really, really special to me. Um, and um, that, you know, there was a, a bunch of times, where other movements outside of my own or the adjacent environmental movement really recognized um, us as political prisoners um, and people that need supported. And that was like, that was really big for me. Um, yeah. I'm a, I'm fresh out, but I'd say 90% of the people I talk to right now are people that supported me when I was inside. Are you still, like you've been out for a little bit. Are you still friends with or in communication with anyone who supported you? Um, yeah. Claude. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Cla I met Claude before going in, and uh, oh, really? I, yeah, I mean that's well, a whole other amazing happy. story that Claude and I still need to sit down and talk about because uh, he was in instrumental in um, bringing animal rights activists together with uh, the San Francisco Eight, um, some yeah. Black Panthers, um, which was a, a whole other like amazing, beautiful lesson learned on my journey to wherever I am now. Um, that really meant a lot to me. Um, and Claude was one of the first people I saw when I got out and I was in the halfway house and I told the halfway house that he helped 
uh, rehabilitate uh, inmates coming out of prison and adjusting them back to society, which was true. Um, but getting yes. together, <laughs> getting together with Claude uh, while I was in the half house, one of the first people I I saw when I got out um, was really important to me. Um, um, and so I think like I think Claude is a shining example of like uh, starting down the road and supporting people um, and seeing it through. Um, and you can see that with people that are still in prison, uh, from the seventies and sixties and, and, um, and how much support that their communities still provide them decades and decades later. Um, and having that spill over, um, to me was really important and beautiful as well. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of people that, um, I wrote when I was in prison or I got letters from and I communicated with and became friends with, and I got out, uh, I got out in 2000 and in, nine 2010 um that i still see and keep in touch with and hang out with and um and am friends with both people that i wrote and also people that i met when i was in prison um and became friend, friends with on the inside that a couple of people that i still communicate with so awesome yeah. claude was uh one of the first people to text me when i got out also and i thought it was a i thought it was fake i didn't think it was real and so that was really nice when josh hit me up saying claude wants to talk to you he's like what's no way. Um, so I want to talk about back to when we were inside. When I went in, I had a view of the world that I thought was complete. And prison really helped me restructure that. It helped me become, like, see things more intersectionally. Like, I didn't come from a movement, so maybe that was, like, natural for you two. But it really helped open my eyes to different struggles and also the struggle of incarceration itself and the impact that has on, um, on certain communities much more than it does on my community. It helped me see what happens to trans folks, to queer folks, to people of color. Um, and it really opened my eyes to have a more empathetic approach and a broader view of the movement. So I'd like to ask both of you, did prison help with your intersectionality or did it open your eyes to anything maybe that you didn't always like think about or wasn't on the forefront? And Claude, you can start. I mean, for me, I had the advantage, like Jake, of having done many years of um, support work for people who uh, were captured as as a product of their resistance. So political prisoner work was something that was familiar to me. So there are a lot of the uh, of some of the more obvious, things about prison that one can absorb through doing that, that are part of kind of fortifying, certainly helped fortify me before actually going in. Um, and, uh, you know, just understanding through our developing relationships with people who were locked up in cages, you get a, you get a, a, a it's sort of a, an, an unmasking of what that life will be when you realize that it that that that's part of your own future or experience. So to me, um, that's also a healthy sign to be building movements where people in their normal everyday life, um, stand against the purpose of imprisoning people in the first place, which is to destroy individuals, families, communities, movements, uh, all of which takes place. And I mean, that's the purpose of isolation and cages. Um, so, you know, being prepared is an important aspect of that. Nevertheless, you know, the it's a very different life when you when you're living it uh, day in and day out. And, you know, whatever you do to prepare isn't an, an, an absolute thing. Um, and one of the things that it that I like to reference that it really underscores for me is the lesson of people's basic humanity. You know, the the caricature of imprisonment and who's in it is, you know, solely about out of control violence, 
never understanding that the perpetrators of that are the people running the place. And the people who are damaged by that process or any other life challenges beforehand, of course, are not in a very supportive environment once they land inside. So I, mean, I don't want to, I don't want to give the idea that there aren't damaged people in prisons who suddenly figure out how to function better socially. Uh, on the other hand, for the most part, even people who are heavily damaged by the struggle for survival in an empire like this um, can and do maintain their basic humanity. And there's a way to deal with them, approach people and develop a relationship that's based on a different set of values that ultimately sees everybody through, whether there's a crisis that's immediate or not. And it's about really kind of a faith in humanity and a sense of what people can build with one another, even in the harshest circumstances that to me is very inspiring about what can also take place in the street. And it sort of a, underscores a, a hope in organizing and in mobilizing people and in challenging some of the backward stuff that invariably is a product of growing up in a, in a society that has really messed up values. You know, and whether that's taking on issues of gender normativity and how that's exercised in violent ways inside um, to, you know, challenging people's sense of being able to get ahead by collaborating with staff in order to get privileges, um, you know, that's something that we can struggle with people about and feel like they're capable of changing their understanding of things and changing their behavior. And in my experience, that was definitely true. I mean, from jump, these institutions are the epitome of white and male supremacy. Yes. And that's certainly inclusive of institutions that, that are set up to hold, uh, women or people who identify as women or who are placed in those institutions for whatever reason um, that are gender non-conforming, you know, it's challenging all the way around. And, and the, the values that are enforced by the institution are about insisting on conforming with the most reactionary values of uh, that white male worlds create. And so um, I think it's an important part of the experience that one recognizes the capacity of people to go beyond that and to transform themselves and to understand who the enemy is in the situation, which is not the guy down the row who, you know, has got some money coming in because of gambling or whatever. So, you know, it, it's, it's complex, but there's something fundamental about that that was very centering for me personally. Um, and, and also becomes a thing about figuring out how do you contribute to building a different kind of community and a different character among people that are struggling on one hand with living in cages for a long time, but also have to survive and have to have the potential to grow and change. So it's, I don't know. I don't know if that was clear, but. Very clear. Very clear. Uh, Jake. Intersectionality. Did prison help you expand upon it? Were you already prepared for these sort of things from 
from doing prison support previously? Did it help you view the world different or did it change how you viewed the world at all? Yeah. Um, you know, when I first got involved, that was like the idea of intersectionality or collective liberation or, you know, however you want to classify these types of ideas um, were kind of rooted in me pretty early. Um, and I certainly was not perfect at it and had a very good political analysis on it, but it was something that was always in my mind and I learned a lot about um, and I continue to learn a lot about. Um, for when I went into prison, um, I think that like for me, what it helped me with was, I think, uh, a little bit of what Claude's talking about is recognizing humanity and people and the different struggles that everyone has. And it's interesting because I had like, I think about this a lot, but I think it was the last panel that Claude and I talked in together. Um, I forget, was that this year or last year? I can't even remember. Um, in San Francisco. The Howard Zinn, whatever. I can't remember what, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it was the Howard but, Zinn book fair, exactly. Yeah. And Claude talked a bit about humanity then and finding humanity in people in, in, in places, including like in prison. I thought a lot about, about that. Um, cause I think that's, I think that's, I think that's what I, I tried to do to a certain extent and maybe didn't really realize it, but I think that like offering, um, an opportunity for people to have a conversation in prison was something that didn't just help me, but I think helped a lot of people. I think a lot of people in there had were in situations where they had to act a certain way and they had to believe certain things and they had to say certain things and carry themselves a certain way. And um, they didn't have an opportunity sometimes for years and years or even decades to be able to like, like have their humanity and be outside of that character that they had to play. Um, and there are a lot of people in there that were legit that way, you know, that were, they were those politics or they were those beliefs or they were that muscle or whatever. Um, but there, I think there's a lot of people in there that also just were in a position where they had to do, you know, be a certain way. Um, and they didn't have an opportunity to be happy or silly or goofy or ask questions that they didn't feel comfortable asking um, in, in, you know, to the people they're, they're around. And I think that um, the only place I actually, the two places I actually saw that happen were in the visiting room where you'd have a visit and you'd have all these guys on one side of the visiting room and all the families would come in and some of them had their kids that they hadn't seen in six months or 12 months or two years. And you just see that like tough guy facade just fade away and you just got to see the real side of people and even more so when the visit was over and you had to line up on the other side of the visiting room and the way we did it, we all waited there while the families walked out and you could see them go out the door and then one whole side of the visiting room was like glass walls. So you could see your people just like walking away and, and like kids, you know, three-year-old, four-year-olds running across the room trying to give their dad one last hug and a cop telling them that they couldn't, you know, is heartbreaking. And you could see like, you could see all the, the the facade of everyone wash away, and you could see who they they really were on 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 the inside. And the only other place I really got to experience that was like in my cell. And some a lot of times people would come in, um, and they would sit down, and we'd have a conversation. You know, people would ask me to help them learn how to read, or help them with their math homework, or want to talk about the trans women that were in our unit, um, or the gay people that were incarcerated or they wanted to talk about veganism or animal rights, environmentalism. Um, having these conversations were things that people weren't allowed to have or allowed to do um, and, and getting to um, help facilitate those little pieces of that um, were really, really kind of exciting for me and, and felt really special. Um, and um, you yeah, know, I think I'll stop there. I love hearing you both talk. I love it. Um, so there's a lot of things I want to ask. And if we have time, like I have a lot more questions that I want to get to about prison, but I'd also like to talk about getting out of prison. And for me, like it's still fresh, of course, but there was lots of trauma and it's not always this stuff that people think about. It's not always like the stabbing or 
fighting or that sort of stuff. It's, it's, there's deep seated like hurt. And I've been fortunate enough to have like EMDR therapy and things like that. And I was very fortunate to have people support me in the halfway house so that I didn't have to, I didn't have to suffer as much while there. So I'd really like to ask you both about if you, if you did struggle when you got out, if you did have hurts, if you did have just any sort of trauma that you had to work through and then like what that was like post prison, whether at the halfway house or at home with your families, just what the release was like for you, like inside and also tangibly. God. Well, I think, you know, I'm not sure if I would use the word trauma exactly in my case, but the, there isn't a day that goes by that the issue of prison isn't part of it one way or the other, you know, whether it's splashing back on something or, or, you know, connected to current work, um, you know, uh, to me, I think it's hard to separate prison from other parts of life. And, um, that that's also a healthy thing it's sort of a reminder of where one stands and that other people are faced with this uh so for me um yes transitioning out is always complicated i think it's more complicated for people who've done a lot more time and who are struggling with health issues for me that wasn't the case um but I know um, that's like the number one thing is to make sure that somehow, you know, we try to figure out how to support people when they're getting out. And in particular, that means getting their ID stuff together, getting access to medical care, catching up with decades of untreated illness of harsh treatment, uh, you know, both physically and psychologically, all those things are real. And that there isn't really a support network. I mean, there's a big fight in California to make sure that people are getting their $200 gate money, which, I mean, what's that going to buy you? I mean, it's a piddly thing. And yet they're screwing people out of their gate money. Why? I mean, because that's the nature of it. What does it mean for someone that's been down so long that they're pretty disconnected from family and community and friends to have 200 bucks in their pocket and have to figure out how to survive? I mean, that's nuts. So it's there is a larger responsibility in recognizing the ways in which even after being released that people who have a history of in, of imprisonment have tremendous challenges in front of them and that there aren't there aren't really social structures set up to embrace them as they come back um there are of course exceptions but you know to me this is part of what building a healthy movement is about is not only taking care of people when they're down, but taking, taking care of people when they get, get back. And, um, there, you know, that involves resources, but it also involves centering them and paying them the respect that they deserve for having experienced prison in the first place and to ensure them that the community will embrace them again um irrespective of you know what resources they already have lined up i said uh jake um just to rehash i uh you've met me and like we've talked and like i still i still suffer or go through like a lot of emotional trauma from prison like you've seen me like i still get emotional talking about it i can still get scared when people are aggressive or whatever. And I had good halfway house support. Like when I got released, people showed up for me huge. And I still have those 
those traumas and those problems. Um, so the question is, what was, have you dealt with any issues since being released? Like, was the halfway house okay? Did you, were you supported there? Did you carry any trauma with you once you were released? And has that carried on now today? Yeah. Um, yes to all of that. Um, I preface it by all saying like, I, I was very lucky. Like I had lots of support. I had people that were willing to help me out. I had someone that was trying to get me a job. Um, um, but that, you know, and that sets me ahead of the, ahead of the, the game there a bit, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I, it, being in the halfway house was awful. I didn't want to be in, I would have rather have stayed in prison. Um, <laughs> but that also made me start thinking like I was only in for, you know, three and a half years. Like, was I, am I institutionalized? Did that happen that quickly where I'm like, I felt more comfortable in prison. And then I started, I still think about this all the time. It's like, does in, becoming institutionalized happen that quickly? And if so, like what a frightening thing, right? Like that we have millions and millions and millions of people that go through the system and they can be institutionalized so quickly where they would rather be incarcerated than one step closer to being home. Um, you know, there was every, every prison is different. Every system's different. Everyone's experiences are different. Um, and like for me, my experiences, you know, I had, a you know, I was in a fairly rough prison for 25 months before I got transferred, but it was, you know, there was a lot of fights and riots and gang warfare and stabbings and beatings every day. Like all that stuff was happening. And so there are like certain ways you, you know, you're supposed to carry yourself. And if someone disrespects you or cuts you in line, then you're, you know, it, it's go time. Like you got to fight that person. And so like when I got out and I'm waiting in line at the bus stop in San Francisco and someone catches, you know, cuts me in line, I can feel my heart start racing. Like, what the fuck? Did this guy just cut me in line? Like now, like, <laughs> how dare he, you know? Um and you have to like go through your head. Hey, it's it's okay, bud. Like, calm down. Um, and and you have to like take yourself down a notch. Um, I the, one of the one of the ways that you had to like behave in prison was that when you wake up in the morning, you had to put your shoes on. You couldn't walk around all day in your slides or your shower shoes because if there was a fight, you can't fight in shower shoes. You have to wear shoes from the time that they open the, the your cell to the time that they close the cell. Um, and so taking your shoes off was not an option. So like, you know, when you get out of prison for me, and this still like sits with me, I go to a friend's house and it's like, oh, we're a shoes off house, you know, and you got, you got to take your shoes off. And I'm like, I can't. And, and like, how do you have that conversation? Well, I can't take off my shoes in your house because like, it means that if there's a fight breaks out, how am I going to fight? You know? And so like in a way that like, um, it affects you traumatically in certain certain cases you know it's like a, a, a ptsd um there is that also feeling maybe a little bit of shame it's like how do i have this conversation particularly if it's someone that's not from an activist background like once i go to like my uncle's house or my mom's house or just some person i just met and they're like hey take your shoes off and you're like well i can't because i was in prison you know what i mean um so there's all these tiny little pieces they're almost like anchors right that were like thrown down when you're in prison and that chain just keeps dragging you as you get out um but i was lucky like i went to the i knew from the very beginning i needed to go to therapy and i my halfway house wasn't going to let me and they said no and i had to fight them tooth and nail to be able to go to a low-income therapist who i worked with for six years uh and she like legitimately saved me and um um and so, you know, I was able to do that work and that, that, that helped me out a lot, but it's not to say that it's all gone and that those remnants and pieces still don't stick with me. They're just a little more, a little more faint, but I also think it's important to hang on to them to a certain regard so that we can talk about them. If you're able and capable to share these things, like we should, because this is a, a, an awful, awful system that we're all thrown into, whether we're you know, activists or not, like, um, if you, you know, everyone in the prison system essentially is a political prisoner, um, by the, the very nature of, of, um, the prison industrial complex and what it is. And so I think it's important that we 
who can tell these stories and share these uh, uh, these stories. And no matter how awful or upsetting they may be, we do our best to share them because we need to continue to talk about the issues um, and, and what happens when people get out. I, uh, I'm not going to say their name because it's security culture, but I'd love to give a big shout out to my therapist because they offer their work to me pro bono. And I don't know what I do without them. I, I cry all the time with therapy. I don't know. You know, firecracker without it um so something i respect about both of you is the continued work post prison and jake i don't know if i told you this story but the first time i talked to claude i was um i was respecting how that past generation our elders stuck with it like saw it to the end like like you said like he said and like i admired that and i was asking him like i don't know if I see the same thing in my generation, like, I don't know who's continuing. Um, and the first name he brought up was you. He brought it up almost instantly. It's like, have you, have you met Jake? I was like, I actually have not met Jake, but I read his chapter. And so that was something that he had a lot of respect for you about. And it's also something now that I know you, I respect the shit out. Um, because it's hard. It's hard to keep working post prison. It is hard to do these things. So I would like to ask both of you, how was it getting back back to activism post prison and what like what have you done that that gives you that sense of like fulfillment or that sense of like i'm doing good work like what are you doing and how does that make you feel while you're doing it or just when you started doing it Claude? so uh, one thing for me is that once I got out, I kept doing prison-related work. Um, and there were a lot of ways in which that manifests. Um, ongoing work to free political prisoners, visiting prisons, visiting political prisoners. Uh, I was part of the formation of All of Us or None, which is an organization of former prisoners demanding, you know, um, a decriminalization of post-prison life in many aspects um, that has a domestic character to it. Uh, I just, for the first time recently, um, uh, visited um, Kevin Cooper, whose face still faces a death penalty in California, as I think his is an important case to be involved in. Um, and he's challenging his conviction as a juvenile, essentially, um, with huge amounts of tainted evidence. I won't go into details, but take a look at Kevin Cooper when you get a chance. But also, you know, understanding that, you know, imprisonment has its forms outside the boundaries of the U.S., so, as was mentioned, I think, at the beginning, um, you know, I was part of uh, forming and participating in a delegation of people involved in challenging imprisonment in the U.S. and former political prisoners that traveled to Palestine. And part of what we did in advance of actually going was putting together a a pamphlet of solidarity statements from people imprisoned in the U.S. with the Palestinian struggle, um, which got translated into Arabic and printed so that we didn't have to carry it into the country through Israeli security. And we were able to distribute and talk about um, ways in which it's important to understand um, building solidarity between, you know, prisoners in various struggles around the world. And so all of these kinds of things, uh, to me, is, constitute, you know, not breaking stride. Um, and so I feel like um, that's not uncommon for people getting out. And I think it's something that should be uplifted 
Um, and there's different ways of doing it. But um, to me, that's, it's sort of integral to how I identify in the world, not only having experienced it, but, you know, maintaining a, a, a connection to abolition politics, to um, supporting political prisoners as well, and to an understanding that political imprisonment for sure is part of a global experience of people who choose to participate in some liberatory politics and resistance against genocide. Thank you so much. Jake, um, so the question, since being released, how have you found activism? Were you scared? Was it hard to get back into it? I have found for me that doing prison solidarity work is just about the most rewarding thing I can do. Like it gives me literally the most like feeling of safety and joy that I can get outside of family stuff. So how has activism been for you since getting released? Because you have stuck with it. Um, so I'd like to hear about your experiences in that. Yeah, that's awesome that you you jump back into it so quick. So that's rad. Um, this is a big question for me and I talk about it a lot, but I'll try to condense it. Um, but, um, I, it was, it was a many different parts. One, I needed to take care of myself. I knew that I needed help in doing that. And that was searching out, as I said earlier, finding therapy, um, to regain my sense of self, but it was also searching out and talking to people that had gone through it before, like Claude, um, so that I could ask questions and learn from the people that did it before me. Um, and so I talked to as many people as I possibly could, or just go to talks and listen to people at Cloud Sp Space, right? I used to have political prisoners come and speak about their, their experiences, and I would go and listen. Um, I remember talking with um, Claude's co-defendant, Donna Jean Wilmot, um, who told me about when she got out. I asked her what it was like when she got out, and this very question, and she said... Um, there was a cosmonaut that was in space um, who was um, from the USSR and the USSR collapsed while he was in space and he had no way to get back because his country was gone. And um, she uh, said that, um, you know, eventually, like, you know, when he came back to Earth, his whole country was gone. It was, you know, it no longer was the USSR. And she said that she felt a lot like that cosmonaut. And that really, like, hit home to me. Because that's, what's that? So that's so deep. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, still, I still, I still remember her telling me that, and and I, um, I could relate a lot to it in a way that I am a cosmonaut. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I could relate to it a lot, and that, um, I felt that also like that loss of community. I didn't know where I fit anymore. Um, I, my movement and my community had changed. Um, the campaigns and the 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 strategies and the theories of change that we had were all kind of gone. Um, they were something new that I didn't really agree with. Um, so for me, the other pieces I did uh, that were important to me was I got involved in movements and activism outside of the animal rights movement, right? Like, you know, a wide variety of different communities I could go to and, and engage in them as a participant, as opposed to an organizer. Um, and I think this is something we should all do if we're involved in activist spaces. We should participate in other movements um, you know, and, and as participants and, and learn from them and see how they organize and what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong, what works, what isn't working. How can we change those things in our own communities to grow on them uh, and grow from them? And so I did a lot of that, you know, um, being in, in organizing spaces as the participant um, and bringing those lessons back to the animal rights movement and beyond and, and having conversations about, you know, this is what I've done in the past and this is how other movements are doing it now. Um, and these is these are how they they kind of bridge together and come together. Um, and if we can take all these different pieces um, and um, create a, this kind of new theory of change, I think we can move forward more successfully. Um, and um, that really that kind of work really excited me um, because I I want to see change in the world um, and trying to figure out the best way to do that. Um, by learning from the past um, and experimenting with the future is what kind of drives me at this point. But I think that was based upon, you know, grew out of taking care of myself, 
um, engaging with other movements and communities outside of my own and learning from people that have done it in the past and combining those three things together is what really inspires me to continue. I love you both. Um, so I want to, we have a, we have final questions, but before I get to those ones, I was wondering if you all just could take a couple of minutes, I'm going to read or summarize some, uh, some questions that we've got in the Q and a, and we can just try to get just a couple minute answers, just quick answers. Um, and one of the first questions is talking about victories inside. And I know when I was inside, I, I probably did it bad by making everything a struggle. Everything was as serious as everything. And it just led to me getting fucked up a bunch. Um, and so what I really found were the true victories inside was being able to still connect with my family, being able to withhold like empathy or being able to be there for other people still and not be so jaded. So I, I would like to know, and they would like to know if either of you two ever had any tangible victories, like getting things changed for the better or just personal victories while you were inside. Jake, you can start and we'll just go to Claude. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there was like little things that I did um, that felt like I was bettering myself or just things that I set out to accomplish. One of the things I said when I went in was that I wanted to maintain my sense of self as much as I possibly could. And that was um, a challenge, obviously, um, but I wanted to make sure I laughed every day. And so I found something that I found humor in which sounds kind of maybe morbid uh, when as someone that's incarcerated, but you have to, like for me, you have to find things that, that make you laugh or smile or make your heart swell, you know, and feel something besides the only emotion you're allowed to have in prison, which is anger. You're only allowed to be mad in prison and angry and upset and, and, and feeling something besides that openly um, to me feels like a little bit of a rebellion. Um, and that was something I wanted to do. There were other things that were like, you know, the, the prison I was in was very racially divided. You know, there's a lot of division, um, and you were expected to, to, you know, as a white person to do certain things and fall in line with certain policies and, and culture and me being able to push back against that and do my own time, um, in a way that I wanted to, that didn't, you know, um, mean me adhering to, you know, racial politics or gang politics, uh, felt like a very big personal victory. Um, and that was very important to me. Um, there were times when we had problems within the prison in terms of like the inmates, um, uh, having problems with, with a particular cop. Um, and for like a very brief moment seeing all of us come together from all the different races and all the different gangs to come together, to go down the main line where you can approach the warden and the uh, associate warden and be like, Hey, you got a serious problem here. Um, and if it's not taken care of, you're going to have more problems. Um, and the warden recognizing, you know, it's a pretty cool story, but you know, the short of the long was that like, we, in my unit, we like rallied everyone. We're like, oh, we need a Sereno, we need an Orteno, we need a Crip, we need a Blood, and let's all get together and we'll go down there together and air our grievances. And I remember walking to Mainline through the, the prison and everyone was like, what the fuck's going on here? This is not what what is supposed to be happening. And we all pull up to Mainline in a line and the warden and the associate warden, the captain, the SIS, they all kind of sidle up, like squaring off. And like kind of looking around and like, oh, what are we supposed to do next? And have someone be like, you got a real problem with this cop and he needs you need to handle it. And the warden going, I hear you. I know there's a problem and we're going to take care of it. And then we're all kind of like, well, well, that's not what we expected to happen. <laughs> we're like, OK, we're just kind of backing away. And then, uh, you know, within a week, the cop was removed out of the prison. Um, it would have been great to have all the cops removed out of the prison, but, you know, we'd take one. And um, that felt like a really big victory, you know, it, and it gave this um, kind of sense to people that like, oh, like, um, you know, we are not a white race and a black race and an Antonio and we are um, a prison class, you know, and if we organize together and ride together, then we can make a really big change. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to see that very often, but the, the few times that I did felt really special. And I hope that those were kind of lessons that or left with some of the people in there. For for those listening who don't know, Jake was at Victorville Medium, which is amongst the worst uh, when it comes to things like violence and racial prejudice. The place is just a nasty shithole. 
glad you're out, bud. Uh, Claude, any tangible uh, like policy changes or um, interpersonal victories that you that you that you won or or accomplished in prison? I mean, none of them were personal. Uh, so I, you know, I think there were there were a lot of things happening when I was locked up. Um, you know, everything from who was going to control the heroin trade to um, whether whether or not there there was going to be some impact on the differential of of sentencing between crack and powder cocaine, which clearly a uh, evidence of white supremacy and the inherent racism of the so-called judicial process and a tremendous uprising inside to challenge that uh, basically with black prisoners taking the position that this is not going to be an institution that you can control unless unless this sentencing stuff changes um, obviously not an immediate victory however what it did create was a level of of uh, organization inside certainly among black prisoners but also to the extent that there was um a, a level of solidarity shown tremendously changed some of the social fabric for a period of time inside i mean you know there were a lot of things that i mean some of the struggles are just revelatory in terms of how stupid prisons are you know uh i i want I'll, I'll tell one stupid story right i really felt like the library needed um you know a dictionary that talked about the entomology of language which exists right so you know, this dictionary gets ordered in two volumes, which has to do with the entomology of language in the in English. And the type is like so small that the dictionary arrives with a magnifying glass because that's the only way you can read it. Well, of course, the magnifying glass isn't allowed in the prison because it can be seen as a weapon. And so what ends up happening is, here's the two volume set of the Oxford English Dictionary, but nobody can read it because they won't give us the magnifying glass to see what the words are. That's typical. Now, I wouldn't call that a large victory, but it's a victory that kind of unmasks the insanity that is goes into you know creating a structure that wants to prevent people from advancing their own knowledge and so there you go yes um for those listening my one tangible victory um i was in the shoe and they had already taken away phone calls visits and emails so then the administration, the warden said that he was going to take away all books, magazines, and newspapers and radios because we were using them as contraband or whatever. And me and Smiles, aka Randy, who's now he was at ADX with me also, he was facing extra charges also, uh, ran the team four days in a row and did a hunger strike the entire four days. And after a while, the warden just got so tired of having to uh, suit those boys up that he let me and Smiles keep radios. And I felt I felt really tough. I felt so tough. Um, so briefly, um, the clock is taken. So briefly, um, if you were to go down today, right now, what would you, what would support look like for you? Like, what would you, what sort of support do you think is most necessary for either political prisoners or social, any prisoners today? Claude, you can start. Kind of sprung that. Sorry. How come I get to start all the time? Jeez. <laughs> These rules are oppressive. You realize that. 
<laughs> creating an institutional process by which anyway okay i mean you know to me uh, you know obviously maintaining connections to you know family and community and political movement i mean how do you fight for that well you just have to you know and people do that and they fight to retain their own humanity inside and they you know look to be look to develop relationships that are going to be ones of sustenance um and uh, you know the prison doesn't want that to happen so that's the nature of what you have to deal with and whoever you are you'll figure out a way to do that if you're going to maintain some kind of centeredness and to me having a long-term vision that we're part of a struggle to try to transform social relations the, we're trying to destroy the structural nature of empire and that's a long-term thing and so we can't be so demanding that our survival is going to be predicated on making quick changes or answering all the questions at once whether we're in or out you know uh you know i'm well into my 70s and i'm still trying to figure out some of those questions but i also feel good about being this old and still being in a position to be able to grapple with the larger questions that are global that are about what impact or role i can play despite a pretty ugly world out there you know i haven't been able to stop the zionists but i'm going to keep trying that's for damn sure thank you jake briefly what if you were put down today or if you had words to advise people on what like the best way to support someone today what would what would your answer be um i'm not good with brief but i'll try my best um <laughs> i think that <laughs> i have was in a unique position because our co myself and my co-defendants we were allowed to self surrender the biggest threat to the security of the united states were found guilty and then put on house arrest for 9 months and then self surrender to federal prison um so i actually got to build essentially my own support um, so from a practical standpoint, like yes to all the stuff Claude said, um, but from like a practical standpoint for me, that meant like building my own webpage because I was a nerd. I built a support webpage. I made a book list, on, um, you know, of all the books that I would be interested in reading. I, um, we did a bunch of fundraising to try to get money into like a support fund that, um, then could be dispersed to us in little pieces throughout our incarceration. Um, we had, we had, there were six of us, so we each had our own point person. Um, and then those point people were part of, um, a shack seven support fund. Um, so there was someone that kind of like spearheaded the, the support fund. And then we had individual support people that we, you know, we connected to, um, what else do we do? I had my paperwork sent in. That's a whole nother discussion, but I had my lawyer send my paperwork in. So it was there when I got there. So I didn't have too many problems um, with, with being labeled this, that, the other thing. I had my legal paperwork to prove it. Um, what else did I do? I had, had nine months to figure out like, what did I want to do before I went in? Like what, you know, food, um, talking with my loved ones, talking with my partner at the time, having big conversations about how relationships would work or look like throughout incarceration. Um, all these little kind of practical things that I did, which were somewhat helpful, but also just to, to keep my mind off it, really, I think. Um, because at the end of the day, you can never prepare for what's coming. You can pretend like you're prepared, um, but at the end of the day, you're going into uh, uh, a a whole new world that probably you have no idea what is what it's like or what is it going to be like. That's something else I did is I I had there were other political prisoners that I wrote letters to that were incarcerated and I said tell me everything and we would write five ten fifteen page letters back and forth for nine months. 
Um, but again, all little pieces that were helpful, but nothing could have prepared me for, you know, what the next three and a half years of my life was going to be like. I was also wildly unprepared. Um, so my answer to that would be interpersonal relationships, build deep connections with someone. If you know, they're going, it's very tough. Um, we've got people like Casey Goonan, like the Florida four, um, will be different Atlanta folks. Um, fighting cop city, different folks fighting against Zionism that will will inevitably end up inside. What words would you say to them to, I guess you kind of just answered, but like, what would you say to people about supporting prisoners, the value of it? Or what would you say to those people going in about the value of their struggle? Jake. Why, why do I got to go first? <laughs> um, I I will um, vaguely answer your question with an answer I always give. But like um, political prisoner support for people that are going in, whether you're going in or when or whether you are going to support people, um, the support is a lifeline. I can't stress that enough. And I was very lucky that I got letters. Um, almost every single day. If my mail was delivered by the prison every single day, I would have gotten letters every single day. That's another story. But um, every letter was like an escape. Um, I would get the letter. I would take it to my cell. I would open it up. I would read it very slowly, five, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, however long it took me to read it. And then I would put it back in the envelope and I'd write a letter in response if I had the stamps to do so. And I'd write a response. Um, and if I was lucky, I got five letters or 10 letters or 15 letters. And every letter was 10 to 15 minutes plus a reply. And every one of those was a jailbreak. Every one of those was an opportunity opportunity for me to escape. Um, and I was outside of those prison walls, outside of my cell, out over the fences into the desert. Um, and those saved my life, like figuratively and literally. So if you are in a position where you're going in, or you know someone that's going in, or you just support the idea of why those people are in, what political prisoners are not, then write them a letter. Write them a letter, send them a book, put a couple bucks on their books to buy things, um, make a new friend, um, and maintain correspondence with that person. It's the longevity of the support that also is incredibly important. Um, yeah, I'll Great. stop there. Um me and me and Josh Davidson, we put out Rattling the Cages, and that's a book. We put it out while I was in the most restricted prison in the country, and we did that because of prison support, because someone cared. He cared enough about me to build a real relationship instead of like a tokenized, here you are. And that made a big difference in my entire life, and we're still great friends today. And like this whole thing is happening because of Josh caring enough about all of us. Um, so that's what I would recommend to that. Um, Claude, would you like to go? I, I don't really have that much to add, really. Um, I mean, I would underscore what Jake was saying. I feel like, um, you know, the, the purpose of the prison is to disappear people. Our responsibility is to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah, hell yeah. Um, so we only got a couple minutes left, so I'd like to talk about what you all have going on right now. Um, I'd like to talk about Freedom Archives. I'd like to talk about um, YouTube stuff and raising raising money for, for all those projects, just whatever you guys have going on right now. If you could just please let the people know and like how they can support it. Go on. Well, um, we're actually working on a documentary that is about the Puerto Rican independence movement uh, told through the voices of former Puerto Rican political prisoners from various, you know, political groups that were part of confronting the colonial state, the United States. Um, it's very exciting. We're going to finish a few um, interviews in Chicago at the end of this month and then start putting stuff together. We've done a couple trips to Puerto Rico, of course, to interview people there. So, um, you know, to me, that's not unusual and part of kind of a continuum of a theme for me. Um, but in the archives, which is behind doing this, um, 
also is constantly hosting people, whether they're uh, young people who are just coming into contact with radical history for the first time or more seasoned researchers. The idea of the larger project is to preserve, you know, the history of radical struggle, the voices that are essentially subjugated, that are intentionally hidden from people in, in order to give us a sense that there's a continuity to opposing U.S. imperialism and, you know, all of the grotesque things in the world. And that um, people have been struggling for a long time. We have a lot to learn from them if we have access to what they experience and think and have to say. Um, and that this is part of, you know, um, kind of growing a movement from this point forward that we not allow ourselves to become disconnected from all of our ancestors who fought hard, in many cases died in the struggle. Um, and that's true globally, um, that the lessons for how to understand the world and how to fight for a better one aren't led from within the empire. They're actually led from those outside the borders that have a lot more to gain. And uh, from that resistance, despite all the odds, Obviously, when you look at what's happening in Palestine, that's a clear example of people who aren't going to fold irrespective of the level of violence that's being unleashed against them. And that struggle, too, has a long, uh, has longevity and history. And, you know, fortunately, the archives is a place that you can actually look into that as well as other stuff. So... Check us out. Folks, please donate to the Freedom Archives. Uh, Jake, what do you have going on and how can people support it? Nothing. Uh, nothing as cool as Claude. Um, so uh, Freedom Archives is amazing. Definitely check it out. Um, I think um, I, I spent the last bit working on a bunch of projects that I suddenly just stopped working on. And uh, I'm <laughs> figuring out how to start them back up. Uh, I'm very close to finishing a book that I wrote about uh, my experiences in prison. Um, I do a YouTube channel uh, that is called The Cranky Vegan, which is a good lesson in pick your username smartly because they'll be stuck with you forever, um, where I talk about strategies and tactics of grassroots movements, predominantly in the animal rights movement, encouraging people to do more thinking into strategic pressure campaignings. Um, I do a podcast called Radicals and Revolutionaries, which uh, season two is grossly overdue. And um, I also do a lot of trainings and workshops um, around the world. I'm very privileged to be able to travel around and do these lectures about my time in prison, about SHAC, uh, the SHAC campaign, um, and also do like um, half day workshops on how to organize pressure campaigns more strategically in your um, in your communities, um, which I'm happy to uh, do if anyone is interested. So, uh, yeah, it's basically what I'm doing now. And uh, just continuing on my growth to be a happier person, which, I'm, which is a new goal of mine. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I I always like ending these things by encouraging people to write a prisoner. Um, I always insist on Randy Platt. He's got 14 more years in the federal supermax. He's my best friend. Um, but any prisoner will do. It doesn't have to be a political one, but it definitely doesn't hurt to support people that are fighting for the causes you believe in. So we all need and deserve love. Um, so just thank you both so much. This was a, uh, this was a real huge blessing for me getting to talk to my two friends. So thank you. And Liberty, if you want to shut it down, get us out of here. Josh. It's actually me. Yes. Liberty's got internet problems. So I'm going to be closing this down today. Thank you everyone for coming out. Um, thank you, Claude, Jake, and Eric for this. And uh, check out the links in the chat. Hopefully you sign up for the next talk and support Firestorm and stay safe and stay dangerous. And we'll talk to you next time.